some of our values as a UCSF pediatric group is a transparency. We wanna give you all the information that we have be as transparent and clear as possible. Uh, we are holding the value of safety, safety, physical safety, as well as emotional safety and well-being. Um, we're holding the value of safety for everyone inside of school building from the children, students, workers, administrators. We are also rooted in the value of racial equity, um, paying attention to every neighborhood, every community, and making sure we're removing any barriers towards optimal health and well-being. We are here, Oakland, in collaboration with you um, to share information and as Dr. Long shared, not to make decisions, but to give you the information so that you as a system, as a district are empowered to make decisions for yourself, the best decisions coming together, parents, students, teachers, district, uh, to make, make hard decisions. And we know that uh, everyone here is invested in making the best decisions for everyone. We believe deeply in recovery and resilience. Uh, we have seen the, even though this is a challenging time for all, we are a year into a global pandemic. I have witnessed uh, teachers, students, parents, the amazing resilience that Oakland always holds. And we wanna share this image that Kadir Nelson painted at the beginning of the pandemic. And what we see here are faces pointed in the same direction, um, facing towards the light. And even though we may not all have the different, the same way of moving towards uh, we towards a direction, we might have different strategies, but we all have the same goal. Um, and we'll get there together. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we want to acknowledge in giving, thinking about health, health equity and transparency that there is a valid mistrust of healthcare system. And that mistrust of vaccinations or health information can come from historic and ongoing experiences of discrimination, abuse, and harm inside our medical field. We know that poverty, education gaps, and housing instability, as well as lack of healthcare, put racial and minority groups at higher risk for COVID-19. We see the impact for Latinx families, uh, for Black families as well. And we know that some of the strategies to slow the spread of COVID-19 have harmed impacted communities unintentionally, including lost wages, increased stress, and other consequences. Next slide, please. We also want to hold, as we're thinking together and making decisions, that communities, neighborhoods have different impact of COVID-19. You see in this picture, the deep dark blue, that's East Oakland where Youth Uprising sits, where our Youth Uprising Castlemont Clinic sits. Um, and we see the number, the deep blue there. Um, communities and neighborhoods in Oakland have many different experiences of COVID-19 based on level of resources um, that COVID infection rates are notably higher in communities that have more uh, in poverty, communities with poverty than in communities that are more affluent. We acknowledge that this global pandemic is stressful for everyone and for all, but we also know that in some communities that there is profound and traumatic impact. And next slide, please. And in addition to the health impacts um, of COVID-19, we also wanna acknowledge the mental health impacts. This moment has created a lot of pain for young people. Um, as Ianad said earlier that there is social distancing, but that social distancing is uh, social isolation for many young people. And as high school students, kindergartners, many young people are experiencing loss of routine. Uh, families are missing that first day of kindergarten or graduation. We're coming up again towards prom season, graduation, and that has had an impact. I know for my work in school-based health clinics, we're seeing greater levels of anxiety, depression um, in families and one in young people. And one of the things that we do know is that there are ways to protect and take care. And so relationships is always a protective factor. And if we can uh, do as much as we can to spend time with our young people, have that one-on-one -on -one time, create structure and routine is also a protective factor. 
uh, if it's safe enough or if you find ways to exercise inside. I know sometimes in our family, we watch those exercise videos. I never did that before, but we're doing YouTube exercise together um, or getting outside as well as connecting to something bigger, whether that's art, um, whether that's spirituality, your church, your temple, your mosque. Um, also many of the many bold initiatives that are happening right here in Oakland um, gives me hope every day. Um, so those are some ways that we can continue to protect against the great impact. And I wanna remind families um, that there are mental health services available in your schools and to access those if you can. Next slide. We also want to lift up uh, the words of Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, um, who really acknowledges that we started this global pandemic with different levels of awareness um, and lots of information as well as misinformation. And that misinformation has the greatest impact for communities that are suffering the most. And we join with Dr. Nunez Smith uh, to hope that we can be a part of a new normal where we are providing trustworthy information um, that restores trust in science, evidence, and data. And we're grateful to be with you today. We're gonna have time for some questions, so I'll pass it to John. Thank you, Santoy, appreciate that. I'm John Sasaki, Communications, Communications Director for the, uh, the school district. Thank you all for being here and joining us. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, issues where not opening the chat, we're just gonna keep all the questions and answers in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please enter them there. Uh, there will be some questions that we can't answer tonight. Um, this is a medical focused uh, webinar. So we're gonna be really focused on the kinds of answers that our experts who are on hand now can answer. There won't be anything like about uh, labor relations issues or anything like that that we can answer tonight, just so you're aware. Um, but I did want to uh, first start off, uh, Ms. Trotter, with a question. You, you mentioned uh, the kind of mental health impacts. Can you talk a little bit about the symptoms that families can notice uh, among their students going through these challenges and, and what they might mean and what kind of help uh, they, they might uh, benefit from? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, John. I think symptoms can be... Um, physical symptoms like stomach aches, sometimes um, being uh, staying headaches. Uh, so sometimes those somatic symptoms I want people to be aware of. Um, it also could be staying a room, isolation, um, sadness, crying, irritability. Oftentimes in adolescence, depression shows up as irritability, right? Um, and we may think, oh, my teen's being moody, you know, oh, just stop but actually that moodiness might be a sign of depression. And um, we always wanna take any uh, comments about, I wish I wasn't alive or I wish I was dead or I just don't have any, um, any hope. We wanna take those seriously um, and make sure that we're connecting to mental health professionals. And, and do they display differently uh, at different ages? Oh, definitely, definitely different ages. And we wanna like look in the younger children, especially in terms of some of that more somaticized, um, which I said, you know, the stomach ache, the headache, the pulling, you know, um, the not sleeping, um, but also in uh, adolescence. Again, we are not yet at a place where we are openly talking about mental health symptoms or about sadness or about depression, anxiety, our fears, our worries. Um, and so, um, Yes, definitely mental health symptoms play differently in different ages, but what we are hoping parents are able to do is to normalize um, talking about those experiences, to be able to be open about kind of your own experience um, and inviting young, young people with curiosity um, to talk about theirs. And, and I take it part of this is based on the fact that when you're going through these kinds of symptoms, you're feeling kind of alone. And when you hear someone else, like an adult, say that, that they're kind of going through the same sort of things or feeling the same sorts of, of, mm -hmm. of kind of symptoms, if you will, that it, it gives you a little reassurance. Is, it, is that true? It can create an opening to talking about it. And, and I think if a, a parent is talking, talking to some degree, sharing about it in a way that you're inviting the conversation, but also listening uh, to our young people and if they are, especially for more than two weeks, experiencing uh, symptoms of anxiety or depression, or even if you're just not sure what's going on, I really encourage 
families to reach out to their schools um, and to know whether it's a principal or a teacher and say, I'm concerned about my child. Um, how can I get some support? Because there are mental health providers that are partnering with the schools at every level. Last question, I wanted to bring up a specific one brought up by a family uh, who said, because of my child's health risk factors, he's been fairly isolated from play with other children. The few times he's been able to play with the other kids, he's experienced very intense emotions, including anger with friends, and he's typically a very joyful child. Mm -hmm. What will be expected of children's behavior when they return in person? And how will teachers, uh, won't, won't really address this, but, but how should we as educators adapt to dealing with these kind of multi-dimensional reactions that the kids have when they, when they get back in person with, with their, their peers? Absolutely. We need to be aware as uh, people are returning to schools that both for children and adults, we have not been around people. So it's going to take more energy to be around people. There might be some skills that we don't have. There's more social anxiety that we all will have. Um, and so we will see more behaviors. And we're really partnering with teachers, administrators at this point to think about the social emotional needs and in classrooms, both via Zoom creating those relationships and community, but also uh, when we return to school, uh, making sure that teachers have the information uh, to address those social emotional needs. Um, so that is an excellent question. And that we are, we know that behavior has meaning, like every behavior is communicating something. And so that we're not looking at that behavior as that kid is being bad or, but it's like, oh, what, is, what are they communicating? What is it that they need? How do we form safe relationships and attend to the need that's behind the behavior? Great. Lastly, um, what this is a question that's in the Q and A right now. What, what, basically, what measures are are we taking to prevent discrimination because of accessing these mental health services? Can you uh, discrimination towards accessing mental health services? Can you repeat the question? Uh, so, so I, th I think that the thrust of the question is more or less: if you if you are a student who accesses the mental health, ah uh, uh, yes, how, yes. How, do you, how do you avoid the discrimination? Of, uh, Absolutely, like the, the, the stigma, yeah. the stigma of ment accessing mental health services. I mean, one of the things that we're doing right now is actually we have a DBT group for Black African American youth. I think one of the things I have so much respect for young people in Oakland. I know that they often are calling for more mental health services um, and saying that we need healing. Um, that's what I've heard from our youth advisory committees. That's what I've heard from young people in leadership um, at Castlemont and other schools. And I think the more we're open, um, as we see some of our celebrities being open, Marsha Lynch, um, Tariq, like we see people who are open about um, mental health is a need, um, just as our physical health is a need. And that's one way to decrease the stigma of accessing mental health services. The other thing is that services are confidential and we do all you know, that we can um, to protect the confidential confidentiality of a young person who's engaging in those services. And that's really, a, that's a cornerstone of mental health services. Wonderful, all right, thank you so much. I think it's time we move on uh, to COVID transmission. And just, uh, shall we start off with Dr. Law? Can I just can I interject just briefly? Uh, awesome. thank you. Thanks everybody for using the Q&A function. I do want to remind folks that interpretation is available in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And uh, some of the questions here, we'll wait until we get to the section about vaccines or about transmission where uh, they're more appropriate because we're going to build in pauses along the way to make just like we did uh, to hit some of those questions. So they're not, they're not being ignored. Uh, we'll just say uh, we'll probably take them as they come. So thank you. And uh, Dr. Long, please. Thank you. As we start to talk about transmission, I do want to create a bridge between the really important information that Centoy just shared with us and the mental health consequences of this pandemic are really profound, even on the youngest children. Um, I'm just going to share briefly that um, I had a second grader um, whose second grade year was interrupted from COVID is now in third grade and just went back to school via a hybrid model for three hours last week. And the experience of being around people, it was so much sensory input for him that I picked him up at three, he fell asleep and he slept until the next morning. And so being aware of the social emotional well being of our children, particularly as they start to re engage in a classroom around peers, it is profound for them. Um, and I and I just can't underscore that enough. 
And so let's move into COVID transmission. And when we talk about the science of COVID, we want to think about how is this virus spreading and what constitutes a high risk exposure. The Center for Disease Control is very clear that a high risk exposure is close person to person contact within six feet unprotected um, between you and that other person for more than 15 minutes. Next slide. And so to say it even more clearly, to get infected with COVID-19, particles from an infected person must make contact with what we consider to be a mucosal surface. That is your nose, your mouth, your eyes. Those particles leave the body of an infected person when that person coughs, breathes, sneezes, laughs, talks, or sings. So there are three main modes of transmission, right? Those modes are droplet in the air, aerosolized or surface. Droplet is the most common type of transmission and it is when large particles fall within typically three feet when an infected person coughs, breathes, sings, talks, sneezes them out. Less common, but still possible, is aerosolized transmission when those particles, the smaller particles, can go a little bit further. Hence, we say most droplets fall within three feet. We need to stay at least six feet away from one another. And then less common types of transmission are what we refer to as fomites. And so it's contaminated surfaces such that it's a door handle or a toilet handle when you flush it. It's when an infected person coughs, breathes, sings onto a surface and then another person touches that surface and then puts their hand on their face, makes, contacts with, makes contact with a mucosal surface, eyes, nose, mouth, and then you inhale, ingest those infected particles into your body. Next slide. And so when we think about the, stage, the stages of transmission, there really are three main stages. So the first is that this viral particle leaves the body of an infected person, it flies through the air, and then it makes contact with a healthy non-infected person. Next slide. So when we think about how we are protecting ourselves, we really need to think of the, this as a way that we are layering protection or stacking protection on top of one another. And there is mutual responsibility from both people that are infected and people that are non-infected. And so we wanna be able to keep particles from leaving our body if we are infected, recognizing that you may have symptoms and you may not have symptoms. And so the way that we can keep particles from leaving our bodies are one, to recognize if we have symptoms through symptom screens. Um, whenever myself or Dr. Espinazzi comes into our clinic, before we enter the building, we have to do a symptom screen. The next um, layer of protection are masks, followed by cohorting with small pods of people and then testing. We can prevent the virus from circulating in the air by making sure that we are staying socially distanced, by if we are around other people, to be doing that outdoors, to have good ventilation, one-way traffic flow. And then to prevent the particles from falling on you, it's masks, it's face shields, it's physical barriers, and it's vaccinating. Next slide. So we always want to reduce the risk of transmission. Right, and, and if we are honest with ourselves, every time we leave our house, there is a risk. This is the life that we're in right now. The only way to have a no risk situation is if you are in a room by yourself all the time. Next slide. So we can think about Swiss cheese as a model of defense and that we need to have multiple layers right between an infected person and us and part of the equation is making sure that we are personally accountable for our behavior and then the other part is this this concept of community mutuality or shared responsibilities 
And so Swiss cheese has many holes in it. Maybe that's why I don't like Swiss cheese. Um, but the more layers we stack up next to each other, the less likely that COVID particle is able to navigate through all of those different holes. And so masking is one layer, avoiding touching our face is another, making sure that we are washing our hands, making sure that we limit being in crowds. That's our personal responsibility. And then the shared responsibility comes from um, ventilation, filtration, making sure that we are messaging about the science of COVID, um, making sure that we get vaccinated when our time comes. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about each of these layers a little bit more. And so the first slice of Swiss cheese is really stay home if you're sick, right? You need to screen prior to going to work, going to school. If you have symptoms, you stay home. And this notion of temperature checks, it's not necessarily effective, right? What we have learned is that many people are asymptomatic, particularly children. And so the most important thing is recognizing if you have any symptoms, which might be cough, runny nose, diarrhea, diarrhea nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Next slide. So physical distancing, again, it means six feet apart so that particles fall within that distance and they really can't go much further. Next slide. The third slice is about masking. And so you have all heard there are many different types of masks out there. Cloth masks are proven to be effective. Those cloth masks are reusable and we now know that they should be at least minimum is two layers. Surgical masks are the masks that we wear in the hospital. They are three layers, they're a tightly woven fabric. And then you, that you've heard about these N95s and these N95s are what we wear if we're getting very close to people and there's a high likelihood that an infected person could aerosolize their droplets on you. N95s are really specialized masks that at this point are for healthcare professionals because we're around a lot of sick people in close contact. There are some masks that we are not recommending. And many of you have seen these masks that have the valve in the front. And the valve is great when it's wildfire season because what the valve does is it prevents the air from getting in, but it allows you to breathe your air out through the valve. And so if you are infected, even if you are asymptomatically infected, it still allows those viral particles to escape through those valves. And so they are not recommended for school situations. And quite honestly, I don't recommend them in general unless it's for wildfires or other types of um, occupational issues. Next slide. Hand washing is still one of our most important defenses. And um, it's great to use soap and water, but hand sanitizer is also fine. Um, we are taught in the hospital to sing row, row, row your boat, but you need to make sure that you wash your hands for at least 20 seconds before and after eating, and that you should practice just washing your hands at regular intervals. To prevent the transmission of COVID, it's less about this notion of deep cleaning as it is um, about prevention and regular hand washing. And so we all should be carrying around hand sanitizer with us as much as possible. The fifth slice is um, a face shield. If you are wearing a face shield, it is not a substitute for a mask. It's just another slice of that Swiss cheese. A face shield is great because it's a great reminder not to touch your, not to touch your face when you're out and about, and it does offer some extra protection. Um, if you wear a face shield, you wear that face shield with your, with your mask always. Next slide. And it should have lateral protection too, so that it covers the side of your face so that the particles don't come in from the sides. Next slide. So for, our, for this slide, I'm gonna pass it on to my fantastic colleague, Dr. Espinazzi. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, Thank you so much for all of that, uh, such helpful information. Uh, the next slice is uh, minimizing uh, time in crowded spaces. Uh, this is because when we're close together in a crowded space, uh, we are unable to observe that physical distancing. And also there's just more of us, which increases the probability that someone might be sick. So for this, we should consider uh, approaches like 
staggering arrival and departure to and from school, thinking about staggering class times so that we minimize how many people are in the hallways, including times when students often come together, like lunchtime, recess, and bathroom times. Next slice, please. Next slice. Um, this is a really important one and one that uh, we have been thinking about a lot, which is testing as well as contact tracing. So when we think about testing, there are three times when we think about testing. One is the obvious one, which is symptom-based. Someone has symptoms that could be caused by COVID. And so because that person has symptoms, then we test them to see that if indeed they have COVID or not. This symptom-based testing is something that we do quite often in our clinical practice, especially with children, because as Dr. Long described so beautifully earlier, children can have more vague symptoms than adults when it comes to COVID. And so we keep... Um, we're, we're, uh, we, we just try to stay suspicious <laughs> and, and test often uh, when someone has uh, symptoms. The other type of testing, if there has been an exposure. So I perhaps don't have any symptoms, but I had what was a considered a high risk exposure, as Dr. Long explained to us, that's closer than six feet for more than 15 minutes with someone or multiple people who themselves have uh, been tested, who have tested positive for COVID. In that situation, then those of us who were close to that person are considered uh, exposed. And through that type of contact tracing, we are encouraged to be tested to determine how long we might need to quarantine and uh, away from other people in order to stop the spread. This is a very important type of testing. This is the kind of public health testing that keeps our community from uh, having more and more infection. The third type of testing is monitoring. So without symptoms and without any known exposures at regular intervals, testing not necessarily everybody, but maybe random sampling of people in a setting uh, or a specific um, types of providers that might be at higher risk to try and see are infections slipping through the cracks? Are there um, people who that we didn't suspect might be positive and indeed are positive for COVID. This kind of monitoring is something that we have been even doing at Children's Hospital. And thankfully, what we have found is that it's not very likely to, for, uh, to find uh, positives that we didn't expect. Um, so the very important types of testing are symptom-based testing as well as exposure testing. Routine testing of everybody is unlikely to be necessary, but it can be considered as part of a reopening plan uh, to confirm that the strategies that we are using are indeed effective. Next slide, please. The other piece that's really important to think about is uh, maximizing ventilation. Uh, as Dr. Long beautifully explained, uh, the COVID is transmitted through particles and the particles come out of someone's uh, nose or mouth as they're talking, singing, coughing, sneezing, and then some of them fall to the ground and some of them might stay in the air. And so the other piece of protecting ourselves is making sure that there is air exchange so that those particles are removed from the air. How do we remove those particles from the air? There are a couple of options. One option is to exchange the air. Because if we exchange air that is contaminated with clean air, then we are effectively decreasing the amount of particles in the air, um, keeping us protected. Exchanging the air can be done with ventilation systems, as well as with simpler measures like opening windows to allow for better air circulation or hosting instruction outdoors. 
The other option is air cleaning and disinfection. So the air is uh, uh, cleaned and those uh, particles are uh, neutralized uh, using uh, systems uh, that are designed uh, to kill off a virus. And uh, these can be portable uh, air cleaners or they can be installed in the uh, in the system of the school itself and both of these strategies are effective and helpful at uh, creating ventilation and thus removing infectious particles from the air next slide please With this, I want to uh, pause and see if uh, there are questions that we can answer before we dive into our section on vaccines and variants. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, one of the questions that we've seen is to, to the effect of, and it was answered in the, uh, the Q&A, but I wanted to answer it uh, live so everybody could hear it. Uh, what are your feelings about what is going on, on the ground right now in Alameda County and the infection rates currently and how that relates to whether schools can open safely? I'm gonna take a stab at this one and then I would love Dr. Long's input as well. Um, with this one, I want to say that we have the um, luck of being able to look at other places around the country and around the world that have gone back to in-person learning and learn lessons about what has worked and what has not worked. So there are uh, good scientific studies looking at places that have reopened where despite really high community transmission rates, so a lot of COVID in the community, just like Alameda County and specifically just like Oakland and specifically just like some parts of Oakland, that within the schools, there was little to no COVID transmission when mask wearing, distancing and hand washing was emphasized. So these lessons of how to do it right showed us that if we are very good at masks, distancing, and hand washing, we can, even despite a lot of COVID going around in the community, we can keep transmission down to little to none. That is very powerful. And these were done before the vaccine was available to drive community transmission down. We've also seen examples of how to do it very wrong. We have seen examples of districts that reopened without enforcing masks, without enforcing distancing, and those had to quickly shut down and quarantine a lot because we learned that by skipping those slices, um, it doesn't lead to the same amount of safety. Similarly, there were some newspaper articles about places in Europe that had reopened and a concern that perhaps reopening was driving transmission and perhaps reopening uh, was causing a lot of transmission. But when you dig down at the numbers, at the data, then what you can see is that um, the oftentimes in these places, there was no masking. That's why that slice on masking is so, so, so very important. Um, and also, um, I think that those were some of those examples where the actual science numbers did not match the bold size of the headline because it, they were really small studies and the argument that reopening schools was driving uh, the, the community transmission was, um, I wasn't convinced looking at the numbers and then looking at the, at the boldness of the headline. Dr. Long, what do you think? So I want to echo everything that you just said, that there have been numerous cases in the United States and in Europe of schools that were very intentional around their safety measures and um, had proved that their transmission rates were zero to none. 
even despite there being higher transmission rates in the communities in which they open. And we need to um, harness all of these lessons to make sure that our kids are safe. And so that's why we're here. And I agree with everything that you said. Great, thank you. Um, there, are, there is a question about um, asthma and other things like that and how that can relate to or exacerbate the, the effects of COVID or, or make it uh, more easy to get it and, and become more sick. So can you address that? Sure, um, I actually am one of our asthma doctors and I have a child um, with severe persistent asthma myself. And so this is a really important issue to me. Um, when we think about that Swiss cheese model, we think about individual accountability and what needs to happen. And so I am rigorous in making sure that all of my children, particularly the one with asthma, is constantly wearing a mask, um, is, keeping, is socially distanced and is washing their hands. What we have also known is that COVID in children in general is much less severe than it is in adults. Um, and that children with asthma are at a higher risk from having asthma triggered from any kind of upper respiratory tract infection. Um, and so we need to take care, particularly with our kids with chronic illness. And so making sure that we are putting those safety, um, safety guidelines in place is just really important. I would like to add that based on the last uh, studies that I looked at specifically looking at the risk of COVID in children. I'm going to ask this. Um, I'm going to answer this question as it pertains to children because I'm not an adult doctor. But as it pertains to children, um, there were there have been many cases of COVID in the United States in children, um, and uh, very few hospitalizations and even fewer deaths. Thank God. But there were hospitalizations and there were uh, serious outcomes like death. And uh, there, uh, the, only a couple of uh, medical um, conditions seem to stand out, specifically being more medically complex and fragile seem to stand out. Um, Asthma did not stand out as a risk factor in those studies, which is really reassuring because asthma is so prevalent in our community. And that is why there are ongoing national registries that are continuing to monitor this. And I agree, I think that um, it is gonna be extra important for um, our children uh, with any sort of medical condition uh, to take extra care in staying safe. Um, although the message for from me to, ev to everybody is uh, I think that all of these layers can keep us all safe. And so if we are observing as many of them as possible, then we can stay safe in spite of this pandemic, in spite of these variants, in spite of the difficulty of making this happen. Great, thank you. Uh, we do have a live question here. I'm going to bring in Mara Larson Fleming. Go ahead, Mara. If you can unmute yourself, that'd be great. All right, I guess we can come back to her. Um, so I think it's time to move on to our next category. Mark, what's the next category right now? There we go, vaccines. And I get to talk to you about vaccines, um, what I call the hopeful stuff. Um, so before I talk to you about the COVID vaccine, I want to review what a vaccine is and what it does. A vaccine is sort of like a school lesson for our body's defense system, our immune system. It teaches the body to recognize a germ before the body ever comes in contact with the germ in real life. And the way the COVID vaccine does that it is it contains instructions to make just one piece of the COVID virus, only one piece of the COVID virus, just enough for the body's defense system to learn to recognize COVID if it ever became in contact with it. 
the immune system needs time to learn this lesson of what does COVID look like. And that is why it takes a few weeks to develop protection after receiving the vaccine. And the body learns better if it gets that lesson more than once. And that's why some vaccines require two doses. However, some vaccines are just as effective or equally or almost as effective by requiring just one dose. I want to acknowledge that there are a lot of questions about vaccines in general, as well as the COVID vaccine specifically. And I want to say that all of the questions are valid because we are all trying to make the best possible decisions for our own health and the health of our loved ones. Tonight, I will uh, hope to answer some of the main questions and uh, I'm sure that uh, we can uh, connect the Oakland community to more talks that are specifically on vaccines. Next slide, please. So the first big question, the one that I get all the time is, we have a COVID vaccine, but does it work? Is it effective? And the answer is, yes, it is. In fact, five vaccines have been developed that protects against COVID-19, and all five are very effective. Two vaccines are currently available in the United States, Moderna and Pfizer, with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine about to be approved, um, likely this weekend. All of these vaccines reduce our risk of becoming sick with COVID, requiring so sick from COVID that it will cause us to be in the hospital and death from COVID. All of the vaccines are very effective at decreasing the risk of becoming sick, being hospitalized and dying. The other wonderful news is that not only does the vaccine decrease the risk to us who are getting the vaccine, but it also decreases how much COVID is going around in our community. Because there are 340 million people in the United States, not everybody is getting vaccinated at once. The good news is that those of us who are still waiting for the vaccines are still feeling some benefits from the fact that others are getting vaccinated because that drives down the likelihood of encountering COVID in the community. In countries that are smaller and have been able to vaccinate a greater percentage of their population already, what they are seeing is a significant decrease in COVID in their population. So the vaccine is effective at reducing our risk of getting sick, being hospitalized and dying from COVID, and it's also decreasing how much COVID we are seeing in our community. Next slide. The other important question is, is the vaccine safe? The answer is yes. This is a question that's near and dear to my heart because I spent a lot of time wondering about this myself and having to do a lot of my own research uh, to find the answer to this question. While the vaccine was developed quite quickly, obviously in the past year, the reason why it was possible for this vaccine to be developed quickly is that there were almost 20 years of research on how to make these types of vaccines that preceded it. So we were ready, as a scientific community, we were ready to make a vaccine like this this fast. Also, there was a unlimited funding to make it happen. And we all know that with funding, with money, a lot of things can happen. So yes, it was developed quickly. And it was because of a fantastic combination of good research that got us to this point, as well as the financial support to make it happen. What didn't happen any faster than any other vaccine was the piece, the regulatory piece. So whenever a medicine or a vaccine is made, there is a process of determining if it's safe for use. 
that process was kept the same as any other vaccine or medicine. It involved large clinical trials that involved people between 16 and 18, depending on the type of vaccine and older, from all ethnicities. And these were all volunteers who received either the vaccine or a placebo and were monitored for effectiveness and for safety for at least two months. The two months period of time is very important because it is the time when short and long-term side effects from vaccines show up. That is how we know what types of side effects to expect from the COVID vaccine. This is also why we are not talking about vaccinating children yet who are younger than 16. That is because the vaccine has not yet been studied and proven to be safe in children, yet the studies are ongoing. But we are, there's, it's not possible to make something available unless it's been studied and proven to be safe. So children will not be required to get the COVID vaccine to go back to school at this point in time because children are not able to get the vaccine at this time because we're still learning about its safety and effectiveness in the younger age groups. What side effects can we expect from the vaccine? Side effects are happen with most vaccines and they definitely can happen with the COVID vaccine. Most often it's a sore arm at the site of the injection as well as swollen glands on the side of the injection and that's a sign that the immune system is developing a response to the vaccine. Many people also develop fever, chills, body aches, headache, feeling tired, nausea, Many, many people develop this, especially after the second dose, and it typically lasts one to three days, and then it resolves. These are considered minor side effects because they self-resolve and they are less severe than having the disease. One side effect that we have been watching is the chance of having a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine. A new report was just put out showing that the chance of having a severe allergic reaction to the COVID vaccine is four per one million doses, which is actually very rare and similar to that of other vaccines. One other important question is, can the vaccine give me COVID? The answer is no. And that's because there is no, vi no live virus in any of the vaccine and there is nothing in it that can come together to become the virus in our body to make us sick. So the vaccine cannot give us COVID, but it can help our body learn to recognize COVID so that if we ever become in contact with it, we are protected. Next slide, please. Other things to know. Again, there are so many things that, uh, so many questions that I get about the vaccine and I recognize that tonight is not just about the vaccine. I do recommend that everybody talk to their doctor if they have any questions. If you're pregnant or breastfeeding, it is recommended that you talk to your doctor, although you can get the vaccine. And in full disclosure, I am pregnant and I chose to get both doses of the vaccine and I've felt fine. Um, if you take any medications that suppress your immune system, you might want to talk to your doctor, as we don't yet know if the vaccine is as effective in people who take medications that suppress the immune system. However, you can still get it. If you have a history of allergic reaction or severe allergic reaction, what's called anaphylaxis to food, vaccine, or medication, you should talk to your doctor, but you can still get the vaccine. Any other medical condition at this time is not a contraindication to the vaccine. So whether you have asthma, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, you can still get the vaccine. The one medical reason that for sure says that you should not get the COVID vaccine is if you've already had a severe allergic reaction to the first dose of the COVID vaccine. What I want to emphasize is that vaccination is a personal choice. A healthcare provider you trust can help you make an informed decision. 
That is why I encourage everybody to talk to their doctor and why I'm always happy to have conversations about any vaccine with any of my patients. Next slide, please. And remember that the vaccine is just one slice of prevention, a really strong slice, a very important slice, but also we need multiple layers of prevention. Next slide, please. And part of it is because of all of the news about variants that we have been hearing. And I wanna to talk to you about it a little bit. Next slide. What is a variant? A variant is a version of the virus that is slightly different from the original because of a change in its genes. Genes function like an instruction manual for how to make a virus. And when there's a change in that instruction manual, the virus gradually changes and evolves. Next slide, please. So any change can make any virus, including the COVID virus, more or less contagious, cause more or less serious illness, and be more or less responsive to the vaccine and antibodies to COVID itself. We are seeing some variants with many in the news lately um, that seem to be more contagious perhaps cause more serious illness and perhaps be less responsive to the vaccine. And with the, all of the layers of protection in place, we can still prevent transmission. This is why this is a presentation about layers of protection. This is not a presentation on any one thing because we as a medical community really believe that it's important to have multiple layers of protection in order to be successful in fighting off this pandemic. Next slide. And with that, I wanna stop and see if uh, what questions there are. Great, thank you, doctor. I did wanna point out that we've gotten quite a few questions about uh, requiring the vaccine of students, requiring the vaccine of, of staff uh, and, and others. Uh, those are questions we cannot answer tonight. Uh, those are things that are still being worked on uh, within the district. So unfortunately, we cannot talk about that. Um, one question real quick. Uh, this has been here for a little bit. What's your opinion of the new one shot Johnson & Johnson vaccination uh, as opposed to the other ones that are, are more familiar? What I like about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is that it's been uh, its effectiveness has been studied um, also uh, with the question of some variants. Um, I think that it's, um, what's been a lot in the news is percent of, percent of effectiveness. And I think that that is not really the focus. I think that the focus is that if we get as many people as possible vaccinated um, as promptly as possible, then that can really decrease how much COVID we see and protect so many more people from getting sick and dying. Um, and so I think that the Johnson & Johnson is a safe vaccine. It's been shown to be an effective vaccine. And uh, um, if I and I didn't have a choice of which vaccine to get, and if it were my turn now to the, get the vaccine and I were told that I was getting the Johnson & Johnson, I would roll up my sleeve and be really happy to have received it because it means that I would have received protection. Very nice, thank you. Uh, let's open up a line. Um, I apologize, I may get this name wrong. Galila Gedley, uh, go ahead and uh, let's see. I want to open up your microphone. Oh, unfortunately, uh, Galila is on an older version of Zoom, so we cannot open up your mic. If you can pr uh, put your question in the Q&A, that'd be great. Thank you. Let me go back to some more questions from the Q&A. Um, Here's one. How are you certain that the vaccine, whichever one we're talking about, is safe with no long-term impact studies? I can try to answer that. And so the, um, the person that wrote this vaccine is right. There are no long-term studies of these vaccines. What we do know is that they have gone through the rigorous scientific method. They went through um, the federal government approval process, and in the short term, they have proven to be effective and safe. And there's no way that we know the, the long-term effects of these vaccines in terms of their efficacy, um, because they haven't been around that long. 
So, so if, if you would then um, compare that lack of knowledge with the long-term impact with the knowledge we have about the potential long-term impact of COVID itself. Absolutely. And so when you look at the risks of COVID and the morbidity and mortality associated with um, having actual COVID disease, it, to my mind, the, the vaccine is really the, the safest option, right? The, the, the benefits of making sure that we are protected um, so outweigh the, um, the fact that these vaccines haven't been around for a decade. They've been around for a year. Um, and I would much rather have a vaccine than actually get COVID. Can I, can I add something? Yeah. Is yeah. it okay? Yeah. The, the, I, I have one other piece that reassured me. As I said, I got the vaccine while pregnant. And so I've, I was making the decision for two, the other person being the person I'm going to love the most in my life. Um, and uh, um, what was very reassuring to me is that for all of the vaccines that we already had before the COVID vaccine, when we look at both short-term side effects and long-term side effects. When we look back, we realize that they all tend to show up within the first eight weeks of receiving the vaccine. And this is what the vaccine scientists who were non-government, so not associated with the government, that independently viewed the vac reviewed the vaccine and live streamed their deliberations before determining that they were also giving their stamp of approval. That is what they spent a really long time thinking about, recognizing, as Dr. Long said, that there was going to be no way of knowing what ha happens in the long term because we this vaccine hasn't been around for long enough. Um, they thought really hard about all of the possible side effects that any of the vaccines that have existed have caused now and in the past. And looking back, they tend to show up within the first eight weeks of getting a vaccine. So, and that was the minimum amount of time that of safety data um, that was uh, obtained for, for these vaccines. Although obviously, um, some people were uh, observed for longer. The other thing I wanted to say is, uh, so uh, healthcare providers uh, began being vaccinated at the end of December. And there's an option to sign up for this app that checks in uh, with you after you get the vaccine asking about any new side effects. And so people have been participating in this for now over two months. And this data is being collected in large registries. And they're paying uh, close attention uh, to this data. I actually got a call uh, from the Center for Disease Control just the other day because they're looking closely at pregnant women. Um, so we're not flying blind here. They're, we're watching very closely for exactly this question, which is an excellent question. Great, thank you. Um, so we have an anonymous attendee who would like to uh, enter a question. I'm trying to find this anonymous attendee. I can't. Uh, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to look for this attendee, but I'm going to open it up for Lisa Rivers, who has their hand uh, up. So go ahead and speak, Lisa. Be sure to unmute yourself, Mr. Rivers. If you, if you can unmute yourself, that'd be great. All right, we can come back to that, uh, to Ms. Rivers. Um, one uh, person did ask, we've been hearing mixed information about uh, side effects. Some have had, so some people have had severe reactions to the first shot, some with the second shot. How do you explain that? And is, are these side effects real concerns for you? I'm happy to take a stab at this. Um, so first of all, um, I want to acknowledge that I didn't feel good <laughs> when I got my second dose of the vaccine. And that was not a good day. And uh, um, if I um, 
Um, if I didn't have that like doctor language in my brain about what counts as a mild side effect or a severe side effect, I would have definitely called it severe. I was feeling not good. Um, and it went away after about 18 hours for me. Um, we don't understand why some people have that kind of, oh, I feel awful uh, kind of uh, feeling after the first one versus after the second one. It does seem like some people who have had COVID already and get the vaccine get more of those, oh, I feel awful, side effects after the first dose as opposed to the second dose. But I think it's safe to say and assume and expect that after getting the vaccine, you might not feel very good for a day or two, either the first or the second dose and plan around it. I know that for me, it was very helpful to know that I might not feel good to have expected it and have already taken some, some measures to kind of have an easier day at work the next day, for example, uh, with fewer meetings and fewer commitments. Um, I want, again, I wanna stress though, that even though I really didn't feel very good, those don't count as severe reactions because they're self-limited. They start and end by themselves and uh, they're not life-threatening. And uh, uh, though they don't feel good, um, again, they are uh, self-limited and short, unlike how COVID, the disease itself can make us feel. Dr. Long, do you have any other thoughts? I am so grateful that I got my shot. Um, and I did not feel good after my vaccine and I would do it again. Um, and this relates to another question that I think we're gonna get to that I might just sort of bring into the comment about as a black woman being really distrustful of vaccines. I recognize that there's a long history of distrust and that we have every right to be distrustful. We have a long history of being abused and mistreated in this country and I believe in science and I wanna live and I want my children to live and I want my community to live and black and brown people have been plagued by this virus. And I think that the vaccine is our hope. It is our shot and I would do it again. In the, in the end, both of you say that whatever side effects you experience from the vaccine doesn't compare to what you could experience because of COVID, is that correct? Okay, great. Um, Let's see, there's a Nicole W. Let me see if I can open up your mic. Uh, Nicole, I think that you still need to unmute. There you go. Oh, sorry, I kind of jumped in late. So if this question was already asked, my apologies. But um, my concerns with the, the vaccine is I, um, um, I guess what you call a, a I have a compromised immune system. I have high blood pressure. I have thyroid issues. Um, so those are some of my concerns as far as getting the vaccine. Um, I take my medication regularly as well as vitamins. The question that I have is I've, I've heard, not a lot, but I have heard of some cases where there have been people who have received the vaccine and still ended up getting COVID. How and why is that, or why do you think that could be? Yeah. So and how can my mind be put? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with getting the vaccine because I just, it's, but and I'm one for getting things that will keep me protected, but my mind is just not there yet with being at ease that it's there to protect me. That I mean, and also as far as a couple of cases where I've heard people dying from getting the, the vaccines. I'm, I'm just worried I'm and, and concerned. And that's what's keeping me straight away from wanting to receive the vaccine. And I have a seven year old, so, and I do understand that they can't get it. They don't have the vaccines for the children yet, but if they did, I wouldn't be, I'm not comfortable with her even having I guess because I just don't have enough uh, information and evidence that is, it's, uh, what's the word? I got a brain freeze, but uh, you get the picture. So yeah, that was my question. Uh, and thank you so much. Mind. 
thankful for sharing and um, mm-hmm. it absolutely sounds like um, you're juggling a lot. And so thank you for taking the time to be on here with us. And I, and, and honestly, I, I feel like this is a great conversation um, for you to have sort of with, with your doctor, but I can give you my impression um, is that what we do know is that COVID tends to be worse if you have other co- morbidities um, such as high blood pressure or other types of immune problems. Um, We do know that studies have shown that the COVID vaccines, the the purpose of the vaccine is to prevent you from getting a lot of symptoms and going to the hospital. And so it prevents the symptoms um, and it prevents the severity of COVID. Now, the other part of the the truth of the matter of the vaccines is that it doesn't mean that you can't um, be asymptomatic and have COVID. It means that you won't have symptoms and most likely you will not end up in the hospital. We also don't think that it means that you can't transmit it to other people. The vaccine is to prevent you from getting very sick. And given that um, you shared that you had some comorbidities, it's, it seems to me that preventing yourself from getting COVID is very, very, very important, but it's a super personal decision that's between you and your family and your doctor. Um, but what we do know is that the COVID vaccine will prevent you from getting seriously ill. And to me, that makes it worth it for sure. If I could, Dr. Long, address the concern about um, whether people have died from the vaccine. Um, in, the, in the clinical trials, uh, there were no deaths from the vaccine. And now that more and more people are getting vaccinated, what we know is that uh, the people who are getting vaccinated first are people who are 75 and older, people in nursing homes, people who likely have a lot of other illnesses. What we know is that there have been, as well as healthcare workers, what we know is that there have been two or three people I think so far out of the over 40 million people that have already received the vaccine who have passed away. And it's it does not appear to be because of the vaccine. Um, there is no nothing that's pointing to the vaccine as the cause. Obviously, this is one of the many things that we're paying attention to. That's why we keep referring to numbers and data because we are all in this together as a community. However, um, at this point, uh, I, based on everything that I have read, I don't think that we can blame the vaccine for those deaths. Um, And we need to continue to learn together and continue to watch for this and many other things. Thank you. Here's a a question that's very relevant. Um, You may or may not know, we have uh, high school sports conditioning that's going on right now. uh, And we're hopefully gonna be able to open up actual practices and perhaps even games. Uh, in the coming weeks and and maybe the next month or so. Um, So the question is, do the doctors think it is safe for high school football to resume? So I have a football player. I have a defensive lineman um, in my family and I worry about this. He has gone back to football practice um, and they are making sure that they do symptom screens. They are wearing masks and um, for sports that involve a lot of contact, my understanding is that they are requiring weekly testing. And so that is the process that my own football player is going through now, um, masking, lots of hand washing and weekly testing. Does it worry me? Yes. Is it important for his mental health that he does it? Yes. Will we comply with all of the testing and the safety measures? Yes. Uh, Ms. Trotter, do you want to comment on this and, and the benefits of, of sports? I just want to speak to that, you know, parents, families are navigating um, multiple risks. And uh, there's a risk of COVID-19 and there's a risk of depression and anxiety. And I think, you know, just as the parent shared earlier, it's like, 
um, you know, what they were doing to try to get their child to have a play date safely outside, um, that we were all trying to think about how to get our children um, playing or outside in the sun or connected to other children, um, that a year is a very long time for children who developmentally, as part of their survival and their developmental growth, need peer contact and play. Um, and so th these are the hard decisions that we're in, you know, so I don't, I'm not going to weigh one way or the other, but I think, you know, sports, right, like to have your child be able to play um, and engage in a meaningful activity uh, and exercise is taking care of one component of health while we're also still mitigating the risk of COVID-19. If I can add, I, I visited a couple of our conditioning sessions at Castlemont High School and saw, you know, a few dozen kids out there, you know, going through their, their drills and everything like that. And I talked to a few of them and uh, there was like this unbridled joy among them that, that because they were able to be around their friends and their peers for the first time in months and months. And so, so I, I, I think that, that, that the, the evidence is pretty clear that, that being around each other is great from a mental and, and, and emotional standpoint. Uh, but, but as Dr. Long said, that, that this other issue is, is certainly still there and certainly something to think about. Um, let me open up, uh, we've got Lisa Rivers. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get uh, you, Ms. Rivers, to unmute. Uh, if not, I've got someone else uh, who I might be able to call on. Ms. Rivers, are you there? All right. Uh, Mag T, go ahead and uh, if you can ask your question after unmuting, please. Uh, Mag T, are you there? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I think I muted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I had a quick question concerning the vaccines. Um, I know the Pfizer vaccine isn't um, available for students under 16. Are any of the vaccines um, good for any children under 16 or are they not available to so they have not been approved for children under the age of 16 yet. And there was a question in the chat about why that is. And it's because the studies were done on adults first and that we are just now enrolling children in the studies and the vaccine trials. And so um, there have been no FDA approvals for any vaccines for children at this point. Can I ask, when do you expect that to happen? They're doing the, the trials right now, are they not? I think that by the end of the spring uh, to early summer, we might know about children older than 12. And that maybe by the late fall, we might know about children who are um, five or six years and older. And then it might not be until 2022 that we know about the youngest age groups. Um, this is based on things that I have uh, read as well as an understanding of how long it takes to do high quality research studies that can make us feel good about the findings around effectiveness and safety. Um, of course, this, this could change. Uh, based on uh, how the trials go. Uh, here's a, an anonymous attendee who asked a question uh, saying, I'm super dissatisfied with the narrative that the vaccine will be our saving grace when several other countries using the Swiss cheese example you've stated yourselves have beaten COVID without a vaccine, including countries as large as or larger than the US. Can you speak candidly about the capitalist push, quote unquote, for reopening versus the health fields push if they can be discernible? Oh my goodness, I, I actually um, thank you for that because I feel as if, if, there had, if we had taken this virus seriously from the beginning, if we had followed suit of a, of a lot of countries, a lot of countries of which were led by women um, to actually social distance, wash hands and mask, we would not be in this situation. We are now in a situation where COVID has killed half a million people and we have a lot of mutant strains. Um, I think the vaccine does offer hope. And I think that we are in this situation because this country um, was not so great about, about masking and social distancing and taking this virus seriously when there was the opportunity to do so. And um, 
even in 1918, that was kind of the case too, right? We had this worldwide pandemic and, and even without a kind of an active voice, maybe dismissing the, the, the seriousness of the, of the, vac- of the, uh, the disease, uh, there was still a lot of conflict as to whether people should wear masks and, and you know, be careful about, about things going on. So this is, not, this is not unique to now, but it certainly is unique to now as compared to the way the rest of the world handled it, like New Zealand, for example. I mean, they basically eliminated it from their country. So um, do you feel like things have changed now or is, it, is the country as a whole approaching it very differently now? I think that I, I'm, I believe in our ability to learn and uh, I believe in our community's strength and resilience. We have been through such a tough year. I believe that we can come together, um, especially with a shared goal of um, being able to join again and be together again, something that we all uh, miss so much um, that we can adapt uh, to things like le- wearing masks and hand washing. And I hope that we are contributing by providing um, the type of high quality uh, information that uh, we hope you can trust um, that can perhaps change some minds and convince some people to adapt to things like wearing masks. Um, that is my hope. Um, I'm curious to know what other panelists might want to say about this. Thank you, Dr. Spinazzi. I just want to say I believe in Oakland. Um, I believe in Oakland. I believe that we can listen to all the different perspectives that are here. Um, I believe in Oakland's parents and Oakland's teachers um, and the staff and the children and that together we will make the best decisions for our community. Um, And thank you so much for allowing us to be here with you to share information, again, to collaborate with you, to be transparent, um, so that you can make the best decision uh, for yourselves and for the district and for the community. Great. Uh, I think we're running out of time, but I want to try to squeeze one or two more questions in here. Um, There's a Ty Sadiq Bickham. Uh, Open up your mic. Ty, if you want to go ahead and ask a question. Uh, please unmute first. Hi, thank you for taking my question. So my question is once um, children, once it's cleared for children to become, um, to have the vaccine, is it gonna be mandatory for them to get the vaccine to re-enter school? Yeah, that's uh, not certainly you heard earlier, but we did say that that's one of those questions we just can't answer who's gonna be required to. Uh, the, those things are still being worked out uh, if, if indeed in the end anybody will be required to have the vaccine. So that's something that we cannot answer tonight. Sorry about that. Uh, let's Thank see. you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, here's a, here's a, a simple one for you. Um, what Does the vaccine cause, Bell, cause Bell's palsy? Can I take this one? Um, in the Moderna clinical trials, um, there were over 30,000 participants, and there were, I forget if it was four or seven cases of Bell's palsy, which raised the concern of, does the vaccine cause Bell's palsy? Bell's palsy is when one of the nerves that moves the muscles of the faces uh, temporarily stops working, and so there's a bit of a droop to, one's, to one side of the face. The reason that it's not clear uh, whether this was related to the vaccine or not is that Bell's palsy is actually pretty common. And the uh, the rate, the frequency of Bell's palsy in the trial wasn't very different from the um, frequency of Bell's palsy in general, unrelated to the COVID vaccine. Since then, as we have vaccinated over 40 million Americans, it has not appeared that uh, Bell's palsy continues to be something that's clearly associated with the vaccine. So it might have been it might have been a fluke. Certainly, we're still watching, and certainly, if someone receives the vaccines and then notices a droop or any sort of weakness of their face, they should talk to their doctor. Great. Um. Uh, can I jump in just for a moment before we close? 
I want to share some just some quick information uh, from uh, Marin Larson Fleming, who is our OUSD wellness director uh, like out there doing great work around vaccine. Uh, I want to share that in Alameda County right now, eligible for vaccines are 65 and over, work in healthcare, for example, in health, like in home support service providers or community health outreach workers, as examples, work in food services, for example, people work in restaurants, grocery stores, outdoor food vendors agriculture and farmer, food manufacturing, food preparation and food delivery. Uh, our child care providers, that for example, are nannies, babysitters, daycare workers, and preschool teachers. Work in education, meaning teachers, classified school staff, custodian, food service workers, and bus drivers. Uh, things, important things to know about this is that vaccine supply is still low and they're still like, you know, people are still working, you know, working to get their appointments. We're lucky to have also the Coliseum in their backyard as a, as a source there as well. And some providers, um, some, you know, county spots as well as places like La Clinica are also giving priority to people who live in the zip, the most impacted zip codes, which are 94601, 94603, 94621, and 94606, and 94607. So many of the places where you saw some of the highest numbers on the earlier slide there. And so John, you want to close this out really quickly and I think we're out like we're out of time. Sure. Let me let me just add too, if you are uh, if you fall in any of the categories that Mark just mentioned, uh, you can go to myturn.ca.gov. Uh, they it appears that uh, at the Coliseum mass vaccination site, uh, they're opening up new spots every day or two. Uh, and so you can check to see if uh, there's availability. You, you may have to go back numerous times to actually find some availability, but, but they generally open those spots up in the mornings. Uh, so see if you can get yourself uh, signed up to get the vaccine, if indeed you're comfortable doing it. Um, thank, thank you all so much for joining us. We apologize for not getting to everybody's questions. We, I, we know that there are so many questions to ask and but we only had a certain amount of time. We will be doing more of these coming up. Um, and of course, when there is more information uh, being revealed, uh, we will, of course, reveal that as well. Uh, one question I did want to address is, you know, do we have a, a plan to open our schools? Uh, the answer is uh, we don't have a date set. Uh, but as I've been saying in the media and other places, uh, we are we've been working to open our schools, uh, at least at the elementary level this spring, starting with TK to two and then moving to three to five and then eventually to middle school and high school. Um, and then last night during the Board of Education meeting and in a message released by the board this morning, uh, the board said that they want us to open our schools at least at the elementary level by the end of March. Uh, so that's kind of goes along with the, the preparations that have been in place by the district uh, going uh, forward. So to clarify, nothing specific there. Nothing specific, of course. Yeah. To move that forward. Uh, again, not a date set, but uh, but that's there is hope because certainly there has been a lot of improvements that doctors have been talking about and, and Ms. Trotter have been talking about. So, so we're hopeful. We're very hopeful at this point. Uh, I want to thank our doctors, our, our doctor partners. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Trotter, thank you very much for your support here as well. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us. And we will update you as we get more information uh, in the coming days and weeks. Thank you very much. Have a, everybody have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Tomorrow's Friday. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs>